Hello, everyone. I am Patricia Butler. I'm the CEO and co-founder of ArtistWorks, and welcome to our live dispatch from home. It's pretty extraordinary today. We haven't been on the air for a while, uh, and we have an extraordinary panel with extraordinary talent. And today we're going to dive pretty deep into the concept of becoming a confident player. But before we do that, and I introduce our panel, I'll just give you a little bit of background on ArtistWorks. We are an online music instruction company, and we work with 37, soon to be 41, <laughs> world-renowned musicians uh, who teach online using kind of an innovation that we have that's called video exchange learning. Um, and so once in a while, we pick a topic and we have some interviews um, with these wonderful musicians, these master musicians. And this particular time, um, I chose the topic of how to become a confident musician, how to become a confident player. And so I interviewed both Brian Sutton and Howard Levy on the subject because, as you probably know, they're pretty confident players. <laughs> uh, and it's been a very interesting conversation. So if you're interested in listening to um, those interviews, the first one is up, and that is the, the interview with Brian Sutton. And you can just go to artistworks.com forward slash podcasts, and you'll hear everything that Brian has to say about it, all his pithiness and wisdom. Um, but they have decided uh, that they were going to invite a musician they have in common, which is an odd thing to say. Uh, but joining us today is Bela Fleck, who obviously is Bela Fleck of the, the Fleck Tones, Howard's founding member. But he's also in the Telluride House Band playing with Brian this year. So what's odd is we've not had Brian and Howard playing together. Uh, and they're still not really going to be playing together, but they are going to be sharing some musical ideas here today. So without further ado, I am going to uh, start the music off here uh, with Mr. Brian Sutton. So here he is. Somebody else. Howard, how, about, how are you doing today, Howard? I'm uh, alive and awake, and <laughs> I'm just raring to go. Thank you. 
goodness i was hoping i could get my composure together before we came back so uh, wow all right <laughs> <laughs> that took uh, some confidence and it also took some ear training <laughs> didn't it you can I call mean, it that <laughs> good, guesswork. <laughs> good guesswork yeah well i know defiant. you defiant and guesswork. know each other one. defiant <laughs> guesswork yeah sure let's just insist yeah. that you drink the right notes yeah that's good. All right. Well, so Bela's gone now. <laughs> He's had enough. Okay. So um, I don't really need to be in the middle of, of this conversation, but thank you guys for, you know, really entertaining us there at the top of, of this live streaming event with some extraordinary musicians. So we want to talk a little bit about how to become a confident player, um, what erodes a lot of players' confidence and also what builds it up. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, who wants who wants to start off the, the conversation a little bit? Talking a little bit about those, that, those two sides to the same topic. Howard, would you like to start us off? Sure. Uh, you know, the, uh, I guess the biggest thing about it is uh, how to practice fruitfully, you know? Because when, when people start out, they usually aren't playing with other people. I mean, it depends on what kind of instrument you play, but uh, a lot of the time you learn kind of on your own with, with maybe just a teacher. That's the way I started on piano. So uh, I wasn't exactly playing in a band in the beginning. And it's different in different traditions. Um, and I think people who grow up in musical families have a distinct advantage if, uh, if there are other people already playing instruments and you just sort of fit in to that whole thing. But if you're just sitting by yourself, this is this is can be a difficult thing. How long should you practice? Uh, what should your routine be? And I remember as a kid that uh, my teacher was very organized. She said, here's how you should practice. First, start with your scales and arpeggios and then play this piece slowly and gradually build up, you know, and then play the next piece. And um, one of the most important pieces of advice that my piano teacher gave me, though, that I think is really good, um, because I, I went to the Manhattan School of Music when I was a kid on, on Saturdays. I had piano and theory, piano lessons and theory class. Um, and so when we would finish a piece to our teacher's satisfaction, we would get to play it in this thing called Music Hour. And the thing that my teacher told me, uh, well, first off, Music Hour, it was the kids and a lot of the parents would listen. and they could also offer constructive criticism, as it was called, after you'd play. Um, and everyone was pretty kind about it. But my teacher told me one really important thing. She said, when you sit down to play the piano, think about the tempo you're going to play in and think about the feeling of the music and sort of almost sing it to yourself before you start. And so, you know, sometimes you see classical pianists sit down at the piano and they're not doing anything, and that's what a lot of them are doing. They're kind of imagining what the music's going to be, preparing themselves mentally and spiritually. So for, for a performance, there's a, there's a lot of preparation that goes on, even at the beginner level, if you have the correct attitude, that you, you're doing something important, you know? And, and I mean, all three of us are performers, and we're... You know, people pay money to see us. And so it's, it's very important that we give them something valuable and that we place the full value in the music that we're going to present. 
whatever, whatever that entails. Sometimes it means just being real loose and having fun. Sometimes it's real serious. Uh, but whatever it is, you have to do it with the correct intent for whatever the music's going to sound like. You know, I guess I could talk about this for hours because it's just, it's so different depending on the style of music you play and, and uh, you know, how old you are when you start performing and everything. But right. uh, that's about all I can say <clears throat> well, right now. No, that's a good, that's a good starting off point. And it's, it's about setting the right mind frame. And uh, I like the fact that you play with intention. You have to think, think about the intent and the purpose of, of what you're doing. I guess that helps get rid of any jitters you might have too. Um, so Brian or Bela, I'm sorry, Hart, were you going to say something else? No, that's interesting that you say that about getting rid of jitters. Yeah, because uh, if, if, if you're thinking about the wrong stuff, then you can think about how, my God, here I am in front of all these people and that can make yeah. you nervous. Just think about the music, you know, mm. and uh, if the people are, are being friendly to you, it makes it easier. If they're talking and stuff, it makes it harder. It's like, you know, being out there in the world performing just throws a whole bunch of stuff at you. And uh, I remember some of my first, <laughs> my first jazz gigs in Chicago, I was just shocked that uh, I'm playing in these bars where people are getting drunk and they're talking and they're yelling and yapping. I'm like, oh my God, you know, they, uh, <laughs> I said there should be a, cl a class in music school called uh, Dealing with Drunks 101. I mean, it's, <laughs> You just have to, you just, you go through a lot, you know, depending yeah. on the settings that you play in. Uh, it's, it can be very uh, distracting and, and upsetting. You just have to have this core of belief in the value of what you're doing to make it through some of those situations. Yeah. And, and we want to, too, uh, thank you for that, Howard, very much. And we want to maybe s speak to those who are not ready to play on stage quite yet as well, but are nervous to do that. So what, you know, maybe Brian or Bela, you could talk a little bit about uh, what might erode uh, confidence in some players, what maybe kind of fears that they have that they could work through. Any, any thoughts on that? Go ahead, Bela. You're, you're muted there, sir. You're muted. What Bela. comes to me uh, that I think about, um, at least just after, you know, listening to Howard, is that um, I always felt that, my job was to play what was in my head. Like if I heard something, uh, talking about your training, we were talking about your training a little while ago, which means being able to like hear something and then know how to play it. And um, and I always felt like I was a failure if I didn't play what I heard in my head. But mm. it was actually very rare that I could actually play what was in my head. So I started to get better at um, you know trying to play what was in my head. But if it didn't happen, um, making the most of what did happen. And then I gradually got really good at turning, well, I, I don't know really good, but better at turning mistakes or things that were not what I intended um, into a launching point. And I discovered that um, sometimes my fight or flight instinct would kick in when I made a mistake um, uh, and, 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 and force me to do something pretty good after the mistake. But if I hadn't done the mistake, maybe it wouldn't have been as interesting a solo. Um, and I'll throw one other thought about, uh, so, so which uh, I guess the point is embracing your mistakes and understanding that sometimes what you intended to play was, you know, surely a great idea, but if you didn't play that, nobody knows it but you. So the, yeah. the thing, what do you make out of, out of the moment when you don't play what you intended and what do you do with that? And there's a lot of tricks that we learn as musicians, um, you know, how to play the wrong note. Oh no, I played the wrong note. Well, you know, if you're, if you're playing more improvised music, you're, there's a way to incorporate any wrong note into what you're doing by, you know, repeating it or playing with it rhythmically or smiling and making a joke out of the wrong note. There's so many things you can do, tricks, you know, uh, in your bag of tricks to, to make the most out of it or play it with a special rhythm. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of ways out of it. Um, but, but I, oh, here's one, the one other piece of it I want to mention, which is um, I would have these shows. Um, this would be like, you know, with Flectones or Newgrass Revival. I would have these shows where I played everything exactly what I intended, like the whole night. And I was, I would come off the stage, I'd be like, wow, I did it. This is the great, like, this was the best I've ever played. And, you know, the sound man, I, hey, wasn't that a great gig? I don't know. That wasn't all that great, you know. And then a few <laughs> nights later, I would have one of those nights where every single thing I tried didn't work out. And I banged against walls and I, I couldn't get anything to work the way I intended. Um, and the audience was going bonkers for everything that I did, as, as opposed to the night where I got everything I was after, which was kind of effortless. I was going for an effortless kind of, you know, success 
there. Um, but it turned out that it was actually more interesting um, to listen to me working it out, hitting a wrong note, making something of it. The audience found it much more interesting. And Miles Davis is a kind of a master at this. You know, when you listen to a great Miles, you think, wow, Miles is the greatest. He must have never made any mistakes. Well, no, sir, because uh, he was a guy who could take a mistake and turn it into the best note you ever heard. So I think that's a piece of, of it. Once you have some strategies for um, dealing with things that didn't go the way you wanted um, and, and the intelligence or sort of the uh, maturity to realize that something better may come out of those supposed flaws, um, then you have another tool in your, in your toolkit uh, to survive, you know, adversity. Yeah. I mean, like the saying goes, it's not necessarily the hand you're dealt. It's, it's how you play the cards right. and that's how you react to the mistake. I, I think Brian, you, you have what I have now come to refer to as the anatomy of a mistake. And I think this is so um, valuable that we need to kind of walk through that. And I, and I think it's valuable because I have heard from a lot of our students that one of the reasons they're not confident and won't take the stage is they are afraid they're going to make a mistake. And so it's helped us think about maybe expecting those mistakes and expecting to use them in, in a musical way. But right. can you walk us through your, your, I don't know, your principle of, okay. of making mistakes? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, to kind of just piggyback a little bit to, and segue into it, maybe, you know, from what Howard said about attitude and uh, a spiritual, almost emotional kind of acceptance about what performing is and what making music is. And to Bela's great points about, uh, you know, going for something and feeling like, yes, I got it. But yet it sort of falls flat, maybe on the audience or those nights where you feel like you can't figure it out, but yet people are are reacting and so that's that's inspired playing and and so part of the attitude and the almost emotional and spiritual side of what confidence is as a musician is this acceptance it's confidently accepting that especially in the improvisational world that things are going to go how they go and confidence is not about controlling that but confidence is, is about riding that wave if you're playing music that is more prepared kind of wrote classical stuff I think a similar sort of playful attitude or, or, or how can I make this piece of music that I've played a hundred times the same way? How can I make this special now? And, I, and how can I accept that this can be special for this moment right now because of this audience, because of this space? And so there's a lot of sort of mindfulness and acceptance that, that I think that just supplies a lot of the fuel for what confidence really is in music, not some kind of I've practiced this a thousand times and I own it and I can force it down your throat. A thousand times it's 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 a healthy you know uh very humble uh i don't know what's going to happen but but i'm going to do my best to tell the story and, and to communicate something beautiful and and honest and meaningful and to all that to say when it doesn't go the way you think it should which is going to be a good chunk of the time um you we call that a mistake right and and so just to even get to this point of understanding what we can learn about a mistake what we learn about is how we react, right? Again, to Howard's great points, these these attitudes, these emotional things, you know, a mistake is an emotional reaction. We, we wince, we have this this physical tightening, tension is physical. And that's, at least in my experience, when I, when I, when I make a mistake, you know, and what I've learned to deal with over the years is recognize this sort of physical reaction. You can see the wince on, 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 on your face if you're watching a video, or you can sort of feel the tension, or even to the point of, if you're playing to avoid mistakes, you can feel that sort of eggshell, you know, just just timidness all the way through um, this lack of trust. You may feel it in your breath. You may feel this sort of more shallow kind of nature to your breath. And I think any of us musicians or not can compare that to times in our life where it's not about, again, some brash, overbold, confident kind of state. It's just calm. It's just accepting what's around me and being okay with things where I'm fully breathing, I am not, you know, tight. And so the whole point of the anatomy, the anatomy of the mistake, as you're calling it, as we're talking about it here, is learning about your own reactions, having this sort of these moments of self-discovery of not if, but when mistakes happen. What are your, what, what do you notice about, and this is, I've done this a lot, where do you harbor tension? Uh, what even set up the mistake that was, that was based on some kind of recognition of tension? And what has helped me over the years is learn to kind of back to that idea of kind of riding the way, real, realizing that with this attitude of acceptance, that I know that a mistake might happen. I accept that when when it does happen, I can sort of choose 
how I'm going to react to that. And to Bela's great point from an improvisational standpoint, a wrong note is as wrong as I choose to make it, or it's as negative as I choose to make it. If I just accept it for what it is and invite it into wherever I am right now, even though it's something different than what I intended, that's that healthy way to not turn the mistake into some, you know, just speed bump of, of, of moment in your momentum, but more of like, okay, this is just an unexpected curve, but my momentum is still, is still forward moving and smooth. And uh, it takes time. And a lot of this is easier said than done, but that's the practice that I think a lot of us do uh, at all levels of music, but certainly in performance where, you know, we just never know, but we have to learn to accept that and then, you know, ride those waves as they come. Yeah, I really like your principle there. Your it's not an analogy. I was going to call it that, but it's really a you know a principle of how to sort of recuperate from a mistake. So you you said something this time that you didn't say in the podcast, and that is recognize the setup where mm -hmm. you know you maybe that mean the setup to a mistake. Let me finish that sentence, and that could be you're starting to rush or you're not listening to your other players and that's gonna that's gonna set you up to make a mistake. So if you kind of learn that, then you make the mistake, but it's all about knowing what that reaction to the mistake is, like whether you carry tension uh, or start rushing more and then learn how to recover from it so you can get back to that. Yeah, I, I think too, the like, when we talk about confidence, I mean, it's not just being a confident musician, it's being a confident person, but again, healthfully confident in, in knowing that, again, you're human and you will make a mistake. And what I've learned, uh, uh, I think, well, what I've really improved a lot around the last 15, 20 years is learning about this kind of stuff. When, when you say set up to the mistake, for me, that's how was I letting potential performance pressures or the fact that Bela Fleck standing next to me and he just took a great <laughs> solo and I've got to take a solo now. Am I going to let that sort of stew in my head and, and drive my playing in a certain way that's not honest for where I actually should be in that moment, which is just enjoying what he did and, and having, a, having a musical conversation. Again, mm -hmm. easier said than done, but uh, that's what we aim for. Yeah. Very, very insightful words. I really appreciate you guys sharing your thoughts on it. I think in the conversation with Howard, um, we started talking about um, a wee bit of a sports analogy. I think it was, I don't use very many of them, but in this particular instance, I had something to refer to. And mm. that was a, a golf coach who had... Um, helped a player unnamed who was struggling with the short game to putt. And he taught the, the golf, the golfer to just put the ball very near the hole and just keep backing up and seeing the ball go in the hole many, 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 many times. So that when you're way back on the other side of the green, it, it more easily goes in. How can we apply that principle to music? I mean, uh, to me, I, you know, Howard, I'm sure you have something to say. I think it's practicing slowly so you play it perfectly, but as perfectly as possible. But Howard, were you going to say something there? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the, the tempo has a lot to do with it. Uh, sometimes people bang their head up against the wall trying to play something they can't play, and their pride keeps them from realizing that there is a methodical way to play it because maybe they played it right and then somehow, somehow they lost it and they try to get it back too hard and then you can't mm. do it. And so then you need to, like this golf pro, obviously he, he, he didn't always have problem putting. There was something that happened that, that made him lose his mojo, you know? And so to get it back, that's when you have to be truly humble and stand outside yourself and not be emotionally attached to the thing that's giving you a problem. You know, just just practice it methodically, even though we are very emotionally attached when we're to the music that we play when we play, which is why people enjoy hearing us. But in this case, you just have to detach your emotions and practice it like mechanically, you know, like, what did I do wrong here? And uh, like, let's slow it down and, uh, you know, just just like take all the emotional uh, stigma away from it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the other thing is uh, sometimes a, a, a different way of dealing with it that I have is if I'm having trouble playing something, sometimes, you know, I'm slugging away at it in whatever key, a G or something, and I can't do it. 
I'll try playing it in a, in a key that's right around there and on the harmonica or the piano, there's a big difference between G and A flat, G and F sharp. And so when I have to play something with a different fingering or different, you know, like all these different techniques on the harmonica, then when I go back to the original one in G, wow, it feels so comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I call yeah. that sur surrounding the problem. Okay. Baylor, were you going to yeah. add something there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I'm just, just off of what you just said, is Abigail, my, my uh, musical and life partner, has often said to me that whenever you learn something new or something hard, everything else that you know becomes easier. And I, um, that made me think of that, what you just said, Howard, about like, okay, you're, you know, you're having trouble in G, should be pretty easy, but you can't. Well, play it in G sharp for a while and play it in F sharp for a while and play it in C sharp for a while and then come back to G and you're going to discover G wasn't so bad and that you, <laughs> you're suddenly <laughs> better at it. Um, but the other thing you said that I was, I was thinking about, wanted to bring up is that um, when I listen to back to something, um, when, when, when I really have had a great show or what I would consider, you know, a transcendental show or whatever. Um, I don't remember very much about it, but if I had a bad show, I remember everything. <laughs> right? I remember, oh, I remember when I played that song, I got to that, oh, I was, so, and I, uh, you know, but on, oh, yeah. on a great night, no, it's like I'm, a, I'm in a bit of a daze and I'm just sort of in the space and I'm not thinking that much and stuff's just coming out and everything's just loose. Um, and so that's an interesting state that you want to try to get into. Um, with the stuff, the, the other thing I wanted to mention about what you guys were talking about is about speed. And Edgar Meyer and I have had this conversation a lot about, I mean, yeah, it's really good to slow stuff way down, but if you're gonna play a piece and eventually it's gonna be really fast, um, you better play it fast. You better play, practice at speed and faster than speed because, and learn how, because um, for instance, especially some of these classical pieces, let alone in, improvising things, some of these classical pieces, when you play them slow, it's almost a completely different fingering and a whole different feeling. You can make it really sound beautiful slow and say, I really got this. And it hasn't taught you, like for instance, for, with Edgar, with some of the faster stuff, he has to do these incredibly fast moving um, shifts where the truth is you will never really know whether he got those middle notes or not. When we get to the real speed of this thing, it's, it's almost more of a feeling and a flourish. And, and he's gonna play a lot lighter uh, at that point. So I think you, at some point you do have to like bite the bullet and practice it at the speed. Uh, before you're ready and so kind of see what's really going to happen when you get to that tempo and see if there's anything you can play at that tempo that doesn't hurt and that you can do in a flow. It's not a battle. And so when I know I've got to do something fast at some point, I remember I do, I do it all. Slow practice does some good stuff, but until I actually start getting in the ballpark of where it's really going to be, I haven't really learned the piece the way I'm going to be playing. Like, for instance, I used to play this perpetual, uh, Moto Perpetuo. And Brian, we used to play it. Uh, we recorded a version of it, and it was a, it was a nightmare to play that piece. Uh, <laughs> but um, I did a lot of slow practicing, and it didn't help me. If I, had, I had to put them at the at the tempo it was going to be at because I had to play so light, and I had to be just move. I had to be in motion. It was not about yeah. being in position. Uh, the motion of the whole thing and what you do. So those are just a couple of thoughts I had about what you. Got. So then, Bela, did you just maybe isolate the difficult areas? Because so many people do, they practice too fast, and they they're playing it wrong, and they continue to play it wrong. So do, do you just well, isolate? Uh, it's interesting. Chick Corea had this theory um, when I played with him that when you made a mistake uh, in practice, you stop and you fix it right now. You don't allow yourself to make that mistake over and over. And so when we would practice a, a sound check or whatever, he would always stop. You know, if he was having a fingering problem or something wasn't happening, you, you know, he was more critical about his own playing, of course as we all are, but um, he had that theory that you don't let a, a problem proliferate and continue. You stop it and you fix it. It didn't always work, but a lot of times it worked. Yeah. <clears throat> well, not what Very you asked me, it just came to mind. Yeah. Uh, if, if I may jump in here, uh, of a, a term that I've come to try to absorb for myself, and certainly when I'm, when I'm helping folks through moments like this, is less about slow or fast, but what's musical about this piece of music potentially? And it kind of involves everything we've said here. And the, the point that we get to is we try to practice something that's musical and manageable. If, if it's something for a lot of folks out there where we're, we're aiming for a tempo, but we're not quite ready. Again, I, I like the idea of not going too slow, but I feel like there's a tempo and it depends on the piece and depends on the context, but there's some experience that we can have where we can combine these concepts of manageable, but also musical. 
because yeah, if, it, if it's so slow and a piece of music sounds, you know, there, there's not, a, for if that's a fiddle tune, there's not a lot of fiddle tune quality about that. But if I can find something redeeming on the musical end that, that's, that's representative of where this tune will hopefully end up, and I can feel that, you know, and be aware of it as part of my quality practice, then that's, that's better than just saying, let's just go as slow as we can. So musical and manageable is, for me, a, a way to kind of uh, sort of sum a lot of that up. Can and I, so, can, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, Howard, absolutely. Uh, th yeah. This, is, this is really interesting because uh, all, I, I really enjoy listening to what everyone is saying about this uh, because it's all true. Uh, and one of the other things that, that we haven't mentioned so far is the, the way tempos change when you perform things live, depending on, like if you're on a tour, for example, for like a month, and you start out playing at one tempo, sometimes a certain tune will tend to get faster and faster mm -hmm. and faster. Um, something you recorded that felt, hey, this is right in the studio, everyone's sitting with headphones on, and then you go out on stage and adrenaline kicks in. Now, I, because I, I wanted to mention, I have this one thing that I've been saying sometimes recently is uh, you can't play faster than you can play, except sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes in live situations, stuff happens, like, like the vibe allows you to do stuff that, that you could never do sitting around in the recording studio or practicing. that You wouldn't have any reason to do it, but sometimes you know, you're on tour, you're playing the same tune or a lot of the same tunes uh, in every show. And you just start getting to know these things in a way and your bandmates start getting to, to know it and having more fun with it. And soon you're playing things like 20 or 30 or 40 beats a minute faster than you were in the beginning and feeling comfortable. Like it's easier even to play these things fast like that. So that's a reality too. Yeah. I love it. You guys are so smart. <laughs> the, songs evolve, the songs evolve on a tour, and it's it's really interesting. Um, we also are playing to, like when the Flectones, for instance, we're all playing for each other. Like the audience is there, and we love them, and we're playing to them. But um, I'm very aware that I played, you know, Sex in the Pan last night, and Howard was there listening. I could tell he was listening because I looked over, and he was listening. You know, he appeared to be listening. So, <clears throat> and I respect him very, very much, and I'm very impressed with his spontaneity. So. That put lights a feather, lights a, lights a fire under me. I'm like, well, I'm not going to play what I played last night because Howard was there last night too, and he knows I, <laughs> what I played last night. So, what can I do that might, uh, turn, might you know, give, make Howard smile, or you know, or Victor, you know, or the other guys in the band? What can I do that might uh, be different from? So, what's what tends to happen sometimes <laughs> by the end of the tour? Like we're really getting up too. So we're like because it's like we're we're playing to each other, and that's okay. And people, some people come to the late show in the jazz club to hear the band play you know, after they played the first set and got the sort of straight version of it out of their system and they want to hear them on Saturday night or the last night of a, of a six night run to see where they've gotten to with this music by the end of it. So, um, and yeah, tempos can go up. They very rarely seem to go down, but they ought to. You know, they ought to. Sometimes. Well, you guys are, are very smart on this subject and, and I'll have you maybe play something musical now um maybe you guys can agree on a tune or something it's entirely up to you we have not rehearsed this but when we come back i would like to talk about beginners and how they can build their confidence maybe into intermediates as well how can we give those living room players some advice on becoming more confident with their playing but in the meantime would you guys like to demonstrate some confident playing <laughs> I'm nervous. Uh, uh, You're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I'm uh, nervous. Something. Uh, and we're obviously not going to play together with because of the delay. You want, you want to each play a couple minutes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Should, should we each? Should we each play a, a like a short tune or something? Sure. Like that? that sounds great. Um, can I start? Yeah. Just because yeah. I suggested it. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I just uh, was thinking about this earlier. It's a tune that. Uh, that I wrote with a dear departed friend of mine, Manfredo Fest, great Brazilian pianist. And we kind of wrote it spontaneously in recording studio. And it was uh, recorded by Paquito de Rivera on an album with uh, Dizzy Gillespie. And then uh, F Flectones, we recorded it on, where did we play Seresta? Was it on the UFO Tofu? Was it on that? Yeah, I believe so. 
-hmm. And uh, it, you know, they, the version that we did, I, I really loved the way that the uh, banjo and bass interacted to, to approximate and this piano part that I had. Uh, next <laughs> I'll, I'll go okay you go i'll put the capo on uh-oh what are you gonna play brian there's something well, here i can't do yeah <laughs> I, I immediately define my lane uh no this is uh this is still june 10th and uh june 7th and 8th are important in the world of bluegrass guitar because it's the birthdays of clarence white and tony rice hmm. uh mm. two of the two of the great legends of this music and uh Here's a tune that both of the guys were, were known for. And uh, it's also one, again, as far as the guitar world is connected to Merle Travis, Doc Watson. But just a little version to honor Tony and Clarence with uh, I'm a Pilgrim. Thank you. 
Snake. Mm. are so talented <laughs> thank you thank so you. much for sharing your talent and and your wisdom and it's really valuable to everybody listening and i really appreciate you you doing that sure um, it's yeah it's good to talk um, about this stuff i think so brian because you've got a lot of your students listening and howard's students listening and bayla's students listening too because he teaches a lot in banjo camp i keep hearing about the banjo camp so these folks, you know, they do want to hear about this and, and certainly hear your perspective. And not everybody's an advanced player and gets nervous when they go on stage because they're still playing in the garage. So um, let's talk a little bit about how, well, let's apply everything to beginners and maybe, you know, strong beginners into intermediate. How do they build up their confidence and what do you think maybe erodes their confidence? Any, anybody want to start there? Uh, I'll say something, you know, yeah, it, right. that I've noticed uh, with beginning players. Now, of course, uh, there are people who begin at different ages. Some people begin at seven. Some people begin at 70. And so depending on life experience and what you've done, you know, physically, musically, if you've sung or played another instrument, 
you start, everyone starts at a different point, you know. But uh, one thing I've noticed in general with beginners is that the thing that I stress to them is uh, it, the importance of keeping good time when you play. And sometimes the mechanics of playing an instrument can interfere. They, they worry about, oh, you know, gee, I have to get this note right. I have to get this finger here and this finger there. Or in the harmonica, I have to get my in-breathing in and out-breathing coordinated and try to play smoothly here. And they lose time. And so uh, just simple stuff like feel the time in your body. This is one of the most important things you can do because if you tell somebody to sing a song, like sing Mary Had a Little Lamb, everyone can go, Mary Had a Little Lamb. You know, they tap their foot along like I'm doing. Dun, 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 dun. And you, as soon as they pick up the instrument, what note am I playing? And their time just goes out the window. So play your instrument like you're singing mm. with a simple tune and sing the song first and then play it so that you have a template to, for, for how to play a tune sounding natural. And tap your foot, you know. You know, it's, uh, and it relates in a very profound way to some of the greatest jazz artists. I know Dexter Gordon, the great tenor player, used to sometimes recite the lyrics of a tune that he was gonna play before he played the tune, especially with a, with a ballad, he would read it as if it were a poem with no comment, like not, now I'm gonna play this tune. He would just say, I remember you. You're the one that made my dreams come true. You know? And he'd read the whole, the whole, all the lyrics of I remember you, and then he'd play it. You know? And yeah. so it's stuff like that, like to not forget that you're a living, breathing, organic being, and the instrument, is, is this thing, and you're trying to link your organic breathing humanity to this thing that's not part of you and, and make it feel like it's part of you. Ah, oh, that's really good advice. I like that. Sing it first, especially with some of these tunes that you know. So, Brian, I know you're teaching some beginners, too. Um, what, what's your opinion on um, how they might be able to build their confidence, or what do you think gets in the way of their confidence? I, I agree with everything that Howard said. I, I definitely noticed that um, if, if I could work with um, a beginner or even a lot of the folks that come in the door on my site are flat pickers, bluegrass guitarists that have been playing a little while. Uh, and, and the main thing that I, that I work with folks on is, is internalizing that rhythm, that the pocket there's just as an engine of your playing. Uh, but I also understand, you know, it's challenging, as Howard said, this this thing that's not part of us that we've got to get our fingers and hands and, uh, you know, for a, a horn or harmonica, our breath and the breathing and what's the words. And there's, there's a lot of complex layers. And uh, all that to say, one of the the, a, a, the best sum up advice that I would give a beginner or somebody that's been at this maybe a year or a few months, a lot of folks got into an instrument during the pandemic and it's first accepting that this is not easy first accepting that a lot of guys like us make it look easy but it didn't didn't happen overnight music is a language and just as any of us have learned a language from the time we were born it doesn't happen immediately we don't think about learning when we were a kid but it takes years and years and years to be fluent and even in your native language and and learning an instrument is similar to that and just accepting that and and, and i think to, to some of our confidence or how confidence erodes in beginners is uh, uh trying to uh, assume these certain expectations I ought to be doing this by two months, by four months, by a year into this. And that's just not the case. Again, to Howard's point, we're, we're coming at this from various life experiences and various ages. And, and uh, I think just acceptance of that is a, is a, is a big part. It's we're, we're in for the journey. I, I myself, part of what I try to tell folks, I'm as much of a student as the person that just picked up the guitar yesterday. I just happen to be further down the journey than they are right now. But I'm just as excited about what I have to learn, you know, uh, tomorrow on this instrument as I was, you know, when I first started. And it's it's accepting leads to that kind of there's confidence. It's confidence in knowing that I can work on that, loving the instrument and just playing for the love of playing, no matter how long it takes. And that helps me deal with the expectations. And then ultimately, um, the working on understanding the difference in doing music 
and being musical. That's been a big one for me recently too. And a lot of that is just knowing what you're paying attention to, to Howard's points of just thinking about the fingers. And that, that is a big part of it. But a lot, what I notice a lot of folks do to limit themselves is define success ultimately by, hey, I got all the notes right. And that is a part of the equation, but it's not the full being musical experience that a lot of us are talking about here today, which is what are the lyrics? What is the emotion of this piece? That all matters at a very fundamental level. And if you, and if you can start thinking about that, even if you are a beginner, what does this song make you feel? What do you do when you hear a good groove from a band that you that you love? Are you tapping your foot? You should be tapping your foot when you're playing, too. Um, so so thinking like a musician, being musical, not just doing music. Yeah, that's a nice distinction. I like that. That's something to think about, too. And I just wondered, Bela, do you have any uh, sort of final thoughts for beginner? I had a couple of thoughts. Um, I can remember them. Um, um, <laughs> no, you're in altitude, right? You're in Telluride. <laughs> it's okay if you forget. Yeah, the mind is a, it's a terrible thing. But um, what I was thinking about when Brian was saying that is um, that sometimes it's just overwhelming when you're starting how much there is to learn, and it seems like it's an impossible amount, and you feel so small. Um, but there's a lot of great musicians and uh, you know fantastic musicians who actually limited themselves to you know, uh, a small amount of language. And, you know, some, some, some incredible musicians um, picked just a few things and got really good at them. Like they got so good at them that um, it, it, it had this power and strength to it. Um, so I think if you can get away from thinking, oh, I have so much to learn. I mean, learn just a few things like really, really well. And then, then um, build from there, you know, gradually grow out, out of, you know, start with a little box of like, I can play rhythm at this tempo and I can do, you know, I know I feel a little bit of soloing or something, and don't be don't be ashamed of that. That's all great. You know, now now like really get good at that. Like let that be. You'll find that you don't need as much more as you maybe think you need. So hmm. um, that's one piece of it. Is is, is uh, you don't need as much. Light. And in fact, when I uh, I'm dealing with my banjo students, um, and I'm always talking to them about like growing language, like for yourself to play. Um, Again, at the same time, I say, say the same thing. You just don't need as much as you think you do. Most people's styles are based on a few things that they do that are special. And then if they grow that, they, they develop that language as time goes on. Um, there's another thing I was going to say, but it's, it's coming in and out of my brain, so maybe I'll let <laughs> um, that's, that's the tell you right error. <laughs> <laughs> or lack of it, right? <laughs> yeah, so. Well, that's okay. Um, any final thoughts on that for beginners from Brian or Howard? Uh, yeah, you know that uh, sometimes people over practice, uh, okay. it, like kind of like what Bela was saying about like the way the chick would stop and sound check and correct something. It, it if you do something wrong, if you over practice too much, you can you can actually get worse. Hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's good to take a break. It's it, sometimes beginners get uh, wrapped up in stuff like what like kind of like what Brian was saying, the, the, the expectation or like Bela was saying, I can't remember who said it, the expectation could be crushing. It's like, I'm supposed to practice an hour a day. No, no, when you're, when you're just starting out, no. I mean, it's, that's too much. Maybe just practice for 10 minutes, have some fun, go do something else, then come back and play for another 10 minutes or so, and another 15 minutes. Don't knock your head up against the wall. Get yeah. to know your instrument. Like, make it a friend, not an mm. adversary. You yeah. Know? I also think that um, people are discovering as they study, you know, learning that we actually do better in smaller chunks. Like what I used to do and a lot of us may have done, uh, you know, spending four hours without taking the instrument out of your hands or mouth or whatever. Um, it actually isn't the best way to learn mm -hmm. that if you take a shorter, a shorter attack, maybe 20 minutes, stand up, walk around, move around, uh, shake it off and come back. You, there's going to be some stuff that happens uh, faster. You're going to learn faster than spending all this time because you, as Howard said, you hit this wall where you're just trying so hard and the, the trying is, is actually stopping you from achieving what, what you want to achieve. The trying is having what you're, you're sitting there trying. You're not actually learning it anymore. And the other thing now, now that you got me going, um, <laughs> there's, um, there's an opportunity for the unconscious brain to do some of the work for you. And, um, you know, um, Howard and I have done a lot of recording. I, maybe he remembers that I really love if we're on a session for a number of days to do some stuff. I love playing a tune the night before we're going to really do like go in and get the sounds and play the song for 40 minutes or something before the day that we're going to record it, you know, um, uh, because 
when you go to sleep, all of this unconscious stuff happens. So if you can figure out how to get your unconscious to do the work, like if you're practicing something before you go to bed or one day and you come back to it a couple days later and you're like, or a day later, um, things, your, your mind is quietly figuring out a bunch of solving a lot of problems for you. Um, so I, I've noticed that and I've, I've also noticed that if you're constantly talking at, at your mind, it's not having time to provide you the answers. So you have to give it some space to do some problem solving too. Um, and uh, just before I am, um, uh, one more thing. When I was playing with, I sound like a name dropper, but I was playing with Marcus Roberts for a while. And of course, I was very uptight because he's like one of these, these guys I wish I could play like. And I was, and I, I was playing with him, and I have the banjo, and I'm like, I got to show that the banjo, you know, has a right to be in a room with the guy. So, <laughs> so I would uh, sit in my hotel room and practice the tunes all day. Now Marcus couldn't practice; he didn't have a piano. He had to show up at the beginning, sit down, hold, and nail it, which he would do. Which drove me crazy because here I have the banjo. You know, I'm practicing in the airport. I'm practicing, you know, <laughs> waiting for the band to come. I'm practicing in the room. And one day he said to me, and we were doing like a five night gig, and he said, um, "Hey Bailey, you're a practicer, aren't you?" <laughs> and looked, like as if he didn't know because he's in the room next to me, listening to me going, blah, 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 practicing these tunes. And he said, "Do me a favor. Tomorrow, try not practicing, and uh, and come to the gig and see what happens." And so I did it. And it, and of course we were warmed up. We've been playing a lot. But that was one of the best nights ever because um, when I didn't do all the playing and during the day, I spent all my energy during the day practicing. Instead of doing that, I, I was a blank slate. And when I picked up the instrument, all this stuff came out hmm. that um, you know never normally came out. And I was playing in a completely different way, um, which is not to say that you shouldn't practice and that you should just. Wait. But there's all there's a there's a use for all of these techniques. And there's times when you need to just stop, put the instrument out of your hands, and let it all ferment and then come back to it fresh. And there's times when you need to be, you know, beat it hard and really work at it and figure, you know, figure out where the problems are and solve them. So you just have to figure out what, what time it is now. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a, if I'll say anything about what Bayless said is, I've done a lot of reading and research over the last eight or 10 years plus, you know, just with, with motor skill research, neurology, uh, mm -hmm. and, and all those points are, are right on. And to add one more as far as, again, practicing in these sort of 20, 25 minute chunks, taking breaks is really good for your brain. Also working with variety. I think a lot of beginners feel like I've got to, you know, sit down and play this one song over and over and over and over and over again. And really, if you have 30 minutes, you're better off engaging in some healthy variety, you know, within that to just give your brain to Bayless to Bayla's point, something kind of fresh. Uh, and especially if you're working with something, you know, more technical, where it's more about how you can transfer and apply or associate certain technical things, you know, like the instrument or, or, a, or a picking technique um, over a, 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 a variety of tunes versus just one song. It's, it's proven in research that that can lead to some, some temporary growth, but nothing really sustainable. And variety helps what's really important be more sticky and transferable. Hmm. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. That is pretty cool stuff. Well, thank you guys all for, for being here uh, this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, your insights have really been very valuable and I kind of wish I had had some of them when I was in college and practicing for four hours straight. <laughs> uh, I should have known that I could sleep and not practice as much and I'd be better. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened, <laughs> who knows? Um, so I think somebody brought up Mary Had a Little Lamb um, before, so I just assumed that was going to be the last song you guys decided <laughs> to play. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, we want to end on a musical note, but I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you're interested in getting some free lessons from either Brian Sutton uh, or Howard Levy that they've recorded here at ArtistWorks, just go to artistworks.com forward slash free lessons. We'd be happy to send you some unbelievable instruction from both of these guys um so we're going to end on a musical note but i'm going to leave it up to you guys to decide what that's going to be decision makers they're all like three ceos on a screen at the same time nobody is sure who to make the who should make the decision okay brian there you go
So that was beautiful. I didn't know if maybe somebody was going to. I'm still sustaining. <laughs> we'll check on you in an hour. <laughs> Thank you, guys. What a wonderful discussion. And Thank you added a lot of depth to what, you know, we already had started talking about in our podcast. And. Thank you for in, in applying your you know, principles and philosophies to all kinds of players. It was really a pleasure for me to share some airtime with you today. Thank you Thanks, guys Patricia. for being here. Yeah, you bet. Let's do this again. Pleasure. All right. Bye, everybody. Ciao, ciao.